the first four sessions here, talking about the character and the person of God. Now we're going to talk about the work of God over the next two weeks. And then we'll talk about the Word of God. Uh, so all of this is a study of who God is. Um, so this week and next week, we're going to be talking about all of history. Uh, from the very beginning, or even before the beginning, eternity past, to eternity future. And somehow we will accomplish that in the two Wednesday night sessions. <laughs> Tonight, what I'm planning on covering is the entirety of human history. From the beginning to the end. In about 20 minutes, we are going to cover the entire story of redemption. Now uh, let's start by looking at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Because this verse kind of puts in context the entire history of the world. 2 Peter 3, 9 says this. I'll oh, back up to verse 8. It says, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, and here's the key phrase, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. What we're going to keep coming back to over and over and over in this lesson is that the heart of God, the desire of God, is for as many people as possible to come to know Him. That's God's desire. His will is that as many people as possible get saved. Now, He knows that not everyone will. But He has crafted the events of human history in such a way that the maximum number of people that are possible to come to know Him, that is what will happen. He has given us a free will, and in giving us a free will, He knows there will be some that reject. But he also intimately knows the hearts of every individual that will ever live and knows exactly what it's going to require to bring them to a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ. And he wishes that not anyone would perish. The desire of God is to see as many come to know him as possible. So, let's go over a 20-minute synopsis of the entirety of human history. We're going to be looking at a lot of scripture here, so get your turning fingers ready. John chapter 1, verse 1, we looked at this last week and talked about God in relationship. This sets up the entire context of human history. Just as a very brief overview of last week, John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so what we saw last week was that you have God, not an author alone at his desk writing history. You have God existing in Trinity, which means God is relationship. God is community. God is intimacy. God is love, both giving and receiving, all within the three in one of himself. And so it's very important to understand that before we ever were, there was relationship. And that is what we're created for. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, says this. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We are created for relationship. This is the beginning. The heart of God is to share that relationship with others, because true relationship and true love creates an attitude of generous openness. And so he did not need us, we were not required, but because of the true love that he is, he creates us in his image. Because his true desire is for that relationship that he exists in himself to be shared with us. That is our genesis, our beginning. We're created for the purpose of relationship. But then in Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 7, we see the fall of man. It says this, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, 
and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed big leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is the part of the story where perfection is broken. Leading up to this point, the eternity past and then the beginning of man, their existence was only in perfection. There was no flaw. There was no deficiency whatsoever. Until man decided to let his own pride get in the way of the true desire of God. And in doing so, everything was broken. In doing so, all of creation came under a curse. In doing so, the sin of the, of the uh, first humans who ever lived created death in this world. And so that perfect relationship between God and man was broken in half. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, God shows exactly what's necessary in order for that to be uh, put away with. It says in Genesis 3, 21, the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And this verse doesn't just talk about fashion, to give them clothes. Well, now that they, they know that they're naked, this verse talks about the institution of the sacrificial system. There's a lot in the Old Testament about the, the people of Israel making sacrifices for their sins, and this is the first time that happens. We know from Scripture that the wages of sin is death, and the reason why that is is not some arbitrary penalty. We've talked about this before. The reason why the wages of sin is death is because if God is the source of life and sin separates us from God, that is a separation from life. And what is separation from life? Death. And so in order to pay the penalty of those sins, there had to be death. And so God, in His desire to restore relationship, institutes the sacrificial system so that Adam and Eve can continue to be in relationship with God. He doesn't just cast them out. He doesn't just start over. He doesn't just kill them right on the spot. He kills an animal for them so that they can maintain their relationship. Once again, the heart of God is for the redemption of man. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 12 through 15, we see that God continues to offer salvation, but man continues to rebel. It says this in 4, 12 through 15. Um, he's speaking to Cain here, and he says, When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. And so Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Even here, in sending Cain out, even here, in, in the face of the murderous sin of Cain, God is still showing that his heart is for salvation. He doesn't just cast Cain out. Because when Cain says, my punishment is too great for me, I will never be in your presence again, I'm going to be killed out there, God says, not so. I'm still going to put my hand of protection on you. We see there that he's still giving Cain a chance. Unfortunately, Cain and his descendants decide to continue to reject. In Genesis chapter 6, we see that God judges man with the flood, but still with the intent to save. In verse 7 it says, I will wipe mankind who I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals, and creatures that move along the ground, and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. After Cain, the depravity of man had reached a point where their sin was so grave, their sin was so grievous, that God had to essentially push the reset button. But again, in His grace, in His mercy, in His heart to redeem man, He has grace on Noah and his family. And so instead of wiping out all of mankind, God continues the relationship. God continues to reach out. God provides a way for Noah and his family to survive. You would hope that after this point, 
man would say, we've learned our lesson. We will follow after the Lord. But what we see here in Genesis chapter 11 is that man continues his rebellion. Here it says uh, in the passage about the Tower of Babel, beginning in verse 5, The Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. And the Lord said, If as one, speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. God knew that if I allow this to continue, if I allow man to rebel in this way, they're never going to come back to me. They're never going to restore this relationship with me. And so I've got to intervene. I've got to do something because his heart is for the redemption of man. And so he uses something like this that seems to us to be a crazy judgment where he confuses them, gives them all different languages, and scatters them over the face of the earth. But why? Because again, the heart of God is for the redemption of man. And so he intervenes and does what is necessary in order for man to be brought down to their knees so that they'll realize their need for the Lord. When we look at the rest of the entire Old Testament, and we could spend all day looking at different passages, what you will see is a roller coaster ride, a continuous up and down of times of faithfulness to the Lord and times of disobedience. Then more times of faithfulness, then more times of disobedience. The people of God wax and wane. They go back and forth. Sometimes they're faithful, sometimes they're not. And God gives them the law to point them to Himself. On Monday night uh, during our college Bible study, we asked the question, what is the purpose of the law? The Old Testament, all these commands, all these rules, what's the point of that? Why does God hand that down? And the simple reason is this, because the law shows us our need for God. Without the law, we wouldn't know how bad off we really are. We wouldn't realize just how sinful and depraved our hearts are. We wouldn't realize why we are so desperate for a Savior. And so God gives us the law not to give us a bunch of rules that if we follow them, we'll earn our way to Him. No, that's not how it works. God gives us this long list of commands in order that we realize, I need God. Because again, His plan is for the redemption of man. And he continues to give chance after chance after chance for salvation. Every judgment that God hands down in the Old Testament is his perfect way of calling man unto himself. We, we talk about all of the atrocities in the Old Testament sometimes. And we look at that and go, why would God do that? Because God is a father who desires for man to be redeemed. And he's got to stop evil in order for good to prevail. And these judgments are God's way of shaking man and getting his attention and saying, Hello, I'm giving you every chance to obey me. I'm giving you every chance to come back to me. If you make the choice to reject me, I'm going to allow you to have that choice, but I'm not going to allow you to drag others down with you. Because the desire of God is for as many people as possible to come to know Him. And so He hands down these judgments and there's these up and down and up and down times in the people of Israel because God's desire is for the most amount of people to come to know Him. And then we get to Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He's the only one who follows it perfectly. He's the only one who lives up to the standard and He sets the example. And not only that, He's the perfect sacrifice for sin. All of the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, the imperfect sacrifices led up to one perfect sacrifice, and that was Jesus Christ. The ultimate display of the desire of God for the redemption of man. We see in Christ that God loved man so much that he didn't even spare his own son. He didn't even spare Christ. He sent Christ to die, and Christ did so willingly. Why? Because God's desire is for the redemption of man. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 through 49. 
says this, As it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, who is Christ, uh, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man, Christ, from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Translation. Adam brings sin into the world. Christ brings life into the world. And that's the dichotomy of the depravity of man and the goodness of God all so that we could come to know Him again. And the saints in the Old Testament are not saved by the old sacrificial system. The saints in the Old Testament are saved because of their faith in a future Savior who is Jesus Christ. And with Jesus Christ, the new covenant of His blood is brought to us and we have a free will choice. Do I want to be redeemed? Right now, in our present time, God is continuing to call man unto Himself, and we have the privilege of participating. Not only do we get the benefit of salvation, the benefit of redemption, God is also calling us to be the ones to share it with others. He's also calling us to be the ones who are ambassadors, because our citizenship is not here. This is not home. Heaven is home. And if there was no other purpose than for us to just get saved, then as soon as we did, we'd be zapped out of here immediately. But we're still here. Why? Because God's desire is for as many people as possible to be redeemed, and we get to play a part in that. And we must. At some point, He will return. Matthew chapter 24, verses 30 through 31. says this, At that time, the end, the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And He will send His angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather His elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. This is what we refer to as the rapture. There will come a time where Jesus Christ comes in the clouds and all of the saved will be brought to heaven with Him. But again, that's not the end of human history. It continues, and we're going to get to that. But we look forward to a time when Christ is coming back for us. We look forward to a time where He's going to rescue us from the darkness of this world. And it's for that reason that we continue to bring others. Because we have no idea how much time we have left. We talked about Romans chapter 14 on Monday night and the fact that we must live in the, in, in the light because the hour has come and our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. That means that the advent of the second coming of Jesus Christ could be any time. And so for us to waste time doing anything but sharing the message with others is a crime because God's desire is for the redemption of man. And so at the rapture, He comes back in His grace. He comes back in His mercy to rescue His children. But time continues after that, and we see the tribulation. Right after the rapture, we see from the book of Revelation that for seven years, there are events that lead up to um, the, the millennial reign. And for these seven years, there are are, are awful things that happen to humanity, but every single one of them, just like the judgments of the Old Testament, is meant to get the attention of man. Because God's desire is not to just judge blindly out of a mean spirit. God's desire is for the redemption of man. And so for seven years, God still gives people a chance to come to Him. Then we see the millennial reign in Revelation chapter 20. There will come a time at the end of the seven years of tribulation where Christ comes back and He sets up His earthly kingdom for a thousand years. And Satan himself is locked up for a thousand years. And during this period of time, what's crazy is that people still reject Him. And the way that we know that is because directly after this is the battle of Armageddon. And there are armies of the earth that, that go to battle against the Lord and are slaughtered. <laughs> 
because fighting God is a stupid idea. <laughs> But even during this thousand years, there are still people who reject him. But during this thousand years, while Christ has his kingdom here on earth, what is his goal? To see as many people come to know him as possible. Because the heart of God is for the redemption of man. Throughout all of human history, one thread has connected everything. God's desire to save man. He has orchestrated history in order to see as many people as possible come to know Him. We may not always understand the plan of God, but His goal is the redemption of man for His glory. Every event that has happened throughout all of human history has one thing in common, and that is that it plays into the ultimate desire of God, which is for man to come to know Him which is for man to be brought back to the state that he was in the Garden of Eden before the fall. A perfect fellowship with a perfect God who lives in perfect relationship and desires to give perfect relationship to us. And every good thing, every bad thing, every confusing thing in between has all this in common. God's desire to save man. All of human history is the story of the redemption. All of human history is one piece at a time, God showing over and over and over, I love you and I want you to know me. And so where does that leave us right now? <laughs> Number one, if you don't know him, coming to know him is his heart and desire and he's giving you that opportunity. And if you do know him, Obviously, his desire for us is to bring as many other people as possible. For us to be the ones to go on mission, on purpose, and bring the truth, bring the light into the darkness. All of human history, from beginning to end, is all about the redemption of God. And so there you have it, 20 minutes, the entire scope of human history. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for truth. And thank you so much, Lord, that your heart, your desire, your will is for the redemption of mankind. God, I pray that you would help us to see history through that lens. That you would help us to see that in every event of history, all you're trying to do is bring more people to know you. All you're trying to do is share your love with more people. To see the maximum amount of number, number of people possible to come to know you. God, I pray that for right now, you would help us to fully participate in that mission. God, I pray that if there's anyone here who's not come to a place of true and honest faith, who hasn't taken the step to commit their lives to you, God, I pray that tonight you would at least bring them one step closer to making that decision. And God, for the rest of us, I pray that you would help us to stop focusing on the things that do not matter, stop focusing on the things that are contrary to the mission. God, I pray that you would help us to give ourselves passionately to the goal of seeing as many people as possible come to know you. Lord, that we would make it our goal to share our faith with everyone, that we'd make it our goal to, on purpose, be the light in the darkness, that in our circle of friends, in our families, in our workplaces, in our schools, wherever we might be, that the one thing on our mind would be, God's heart is for the redemption of man, and he sent me to be a part of that mission. God, I thank you so much for this youth group and all that you're accomplishing in us and through us. God, I pray that you would bring us into a deeper relationship with you and with each other. And God, as we discuss this now in our family groups, I pray for honest, open, genuine conversation, that we might help one another, that as iron sharpens iron, we might help each other grow closer to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.